Since hockey is a team sport, first and foremost, this has made it easier over the years to spot those who aren't exactly team players. Usually, they're all about the money and are seeking personal preferences over helping the team fully. And in some cases, they've been purposefully doing whatever it takes to stay in the limelight and headlines as well. In this video, we're going to go over some of the most selfish players to play in the NHL within recent years. And with that, here are the top five most selfish players to come along within the last decade. Drafted first overall by Atlanta in 2001, Ilya Kovalchuk quickly assumed the mantle of being the Thrasher's best franchise player for several years. After being an integral part of the team for nearly a decade, Kovalchuk, who was due for a contract extension in 2010, was instead traded to New Jersey thereafter. Reason being, despite being offered a massive 12-year deal valued at $101 million, according to an article by CBC, the forward wasn't pleased with the direction that the team had been going in. However, also in the article was a claim by GM Don Waddell that, for the longest time throughout contract negotiations, that Kubelchuk claimed to have a strong desire to be a thrasher for life. Well, after his signing rights were dealt to the Devils, Kovalchuk was a welcomed addition to the lineup in the Garden State. GM Lou Lamorello was eager to give his newly acquired player the financial incentive needed for him to hopefully remain with the team. The first attempt at a lengthy deal of 17 years, valued at $101 million, was immediately rejected by the league. And, due to what the league saw as cap circumvention, the Devils were made to pay a $3 million penalty and to surrender a first and a third round pick in result. But the second time around was a success, as the Devils and Kovalchuk were able to settle on the term of 15 years and a value of $100 million. Unfortunately, though, he wouldn't even come close to playing the full contract out at all. Following a trip to the Stanley Cup Finals, not long after, Kovalchuk, at 30 years of age, formally announced his retirement from the NHL, while stating that the main reason was to remain in Russia and to spend time with his family, which he could have done, but Kovalchuk had other plans. Instead of trying to play out the contract or simply retire and relocate, Kovalchuk decided to resume play in the KHL instead. This didn't exactly sit well with Devils fans. One good thing that did come about, however, due to the premature NHL exit of Kovalchuk, was that the Devils did get a first round selection in 2014. However, instead of selecting somewhere close to 14th, Lamorello was given the 30th choice instead. Therefore, looking back today, it's possible that the Devils could have selected Dylan Larkin or David Pasternak, which would have changed things drastically. Known as one of the most polarizing players to date that graced the league with his presence, Sean Avery, throughout his decade of time spent in the NHL, made plenty of enemies. And really, looking back, it seemed like the attention that the forward received, whether it be good or bad, fueled his questionable antics that much further as Avery appeared to have an ego that was more visible than most. For example, according to an article from Sports Illustrated, when Avery first came onto the scene undrafted from the OHL, he demanded that his teammates call him A-Dog. Mind you, in the early 2000s, the team in Detroit consisted of six future Hall of Famers. And it was antics like these that set Avery apart from the rest. Instead of adopting the team first mentality and following the unspoken rules within hockey culture, Avery neglected such things and while doing so, remained in the spotlight. An article, which I'll reference below, claims that between periods in the locker room, Avery wouldn't look at his teammates at all and instead would have his headphones in, neglecting to take in the environment around him. Former teammate Mike Madonna admitted in hindsight that Avery was also usually talking on his phone in the dressing room in pursuit of acting gigs. Madonna also revealed that Avery didn't adhere to dress code rules either. For example, he would show up with shorts along with a sport jacket to preseason games because, according to Madonna, he felt he wouldn't be able to adequately express himself otherwise. It was also during his time in Dallas that Avery made the infamous sloppy seconds comment directed at Dion Phaneuf and his ex-girlfriend Alicia Cuthbert. So yes, in turn, Avery was valuable at times for wearing down the opposition with his outlandish tactics, but at the same time, the baggage that he carried along with him was often too much for teams to bear. 
For more reasons than one, Evander Kane has found himself in the center of controversy. And really, pretty much as soon as his career commenced, Kane was already cementing himself, similarly to Avery, as being a polarizing player, as Kane began to make headlines for all the wrong reasons during his time as a Winnipeg Jet. From reportedly dining and ditching in local restaurants, to posing provocatively with lots of cash on Instagram, Kane didn't exactly get off on the right foot with fans in Manitoba. But unfortunately for Kane, it wasn't just the fan base that he struggled to please, as he also had a difficult time adhering to team roles and regulations, such as dress code and promptness when it came to team meetings and practices. And due to the carefree behavior, he was scratched by both head coaches that he had during his time with Winnipeg. It almost seemed like everywhere Kane went, he made an enemy in the dressing room as well. Dustin Bufflin, Dustin Falk, and multiple unnamed Sharks players, all at one point in time, found Kane's antics to be intolerable. However, despite his past, Kane seems to be, at least from the outside, acclimating well in Edmonton. Call it maturity or self-work. But for the first time in his NHL career, Kane has managed to find a team and a fan base that seem to embrace him with open arms. While Alex Radulov has been flying under the radar in Dallas and has avoided being in the spotlight for the wrong reasons, during his time spent in the Music City, well, that was a different story. Back in 2008, nearly a decade before they would make their first appearance in the Stanley Cup Finals, the Nashville Predators were a team that wasn't exactly a contender. With the young Shea Weber and Ryan Suter in the lineup, the Preds had some bright spots but were lacking star talents. Therefore, when Radulov decided to bolt for the KHL in 2008 for a bigger paycheck, Nashville's fan base didn't exactly take kindly to the decision. Even when he returned to finish out his contract with the Preds, Radulov continued to fall even further out of fans' graces. By the time the 2012 playoffs came around, the Preds were beginning to embrace the identity that they still have today, of being a defensively-minded team with structure. Led by captain Shea Weber and Coached by Barry Trotz, the team had made it to the second round after defeating Detroit. However, despite being one of the team's most offensively gifted players, Radulov decided to stay out late the night before Game 2 against the Coyotes. Due to his actions and those of the teammate that accompanied him, Radulov was suspended for Game 3. Since Nashville was already trailing the Yotes, who had won the first two games, this is the last thing that the team needed to get back in the series. Predators GM David Poyle had this to say regarding the situation. It happened. It's really unfortunate. It's selfish behavior, and we'll just have to leave it at that, Poyle said. Captain Shea Weber also had a similar take on the incident, while saying, unselfishness, it is essential to teammates and team success. We supersedes me, he said. Not very many players in today's modern era of hockey have strayed as much as Pierre-Luc Dubois has from unspoken cultural norms in the NHL world, meaning that what most players deem as acceptable and unacceptable is completely different from Dubois' own perspective. Starting in Columbus, Dubois quickly became the focus of media attention, beginning in January of last year. Reason being, after spending nearly five years with the team that drafted him, Dubois had formally submitted a trade request. However, after a few weeks following the headline coming to light, Dubois decided he was going to purposefully speed things up. Therefore, in an act of manipulation really, Dubois stopped trying altogether during a tilt against Tampa Bay. The apathy was so obvious that it grabbed the attention immediately of head coach at the time, John Tortorella, who wasn't happy with the behavior in the slightest. Even after he was traded to Winnipeg, Dubois, a little more than a year later, began to again voice his unhappiness about being on a particular team. According to NHL insider Elliot Friedman, Dubois told GM Kevin Dayoff that he would be testing free agency in 2024. Even though Dubois did come out and say that he didn't formally ask to be traded, which may be true, the information that came from one of, if not the most respected insiders in the sports has to have some merit to it logically. Knowing that Dubois, at one time, put his own needs above those of the team in Columbus. Also, going on logic again, we have to at least entertain the idea that he'd do the exact same thing again and leave Winnipeg. 